I'm a California native. I was born in San Diego after the war, and I grew up in Southern California in a little town called Upland. It's a, it was an orange grove town, and it smelled beautiful at night, and the mountains were very close, and lots of rocks and native plants, and out in Claremont there were lots of artists. Claremont is a college town, and when I was a kid, I was taken to workshops that the local artists offered for children, and those were very influential on my development as an artist, because the artists, they were wonderful, they were generous, they were kindly, they were patient, they liked the kids, and they loved sharing their materials. I went to Immaculate Heart College in the early 70s. It had become famous um, for its innovative art teaching techniques with Sister Corita. Uh, she wasn't there when I got there, but the, the, we had uh, teachers, mostly they were from Europe and some of them had worked at the Bauhaus before the war. And they had very liberal and open-minded ideas towards uh, architecture and painting and the understanding of painting. And uh, all my classes were, they were heaven to me. They were heaven. And they changed my, they challenged my thinking and they challenged all the art education I'd received previously. I moved to the Eastern Sierra and I was living in a small trailer and I was camping to save money instead of a park. And I camped at uh, a small campground called Independence Creek. And it was January and it was right after a record snowfall. And so the creek was running very high. Everything was rich with water and uh, the water trees were red birch and they were almost in flames. The color was so rich. The reds and russets and purples. It was a pretty astonishing and I had always loved that campground because I'd been taken there as a kid. And I ran around with my camera taking pictures and then I wanted to start trying to get that color into a page. But I had left all my art supplies in storage. And all I had was simple things that I was using to work in a, in a notebook. So I had a little bit of watercolor and a small palette and a bunch of old color pencils. And I, th I started to try to get the colors down using those materials. And I had um, an old stack of cotton paper, Arsh cotton watercolor paper. That's what I had to work with. So I made it work. And I began to really appreciate that the pencil could pick up the linear quality of the sucker shoots and thicket work that um, that kind of that spurt of growth in early spring brings out. And I could use all different oranges and reds and brick colors. And uh, then I could, I could smear it just a little bit. The, the hard wax is, you can't blend it like pastel, but it does kind of rub around a little bit. And I began to like what I was doing and uh, replacing the pencils as I wore them out. It was cheap, they're only a buck a piece. And um, I had enough old watercolors dried out in tubes. I'd peel the tube off and use the good watercolor inside. And I, it developed into a technique because it's what I had. And I began to like it and to learn how to use it. And then later on, I began to buy the materials with intent to, to keep going with that technique. But it was just something that I developed on the spur of the moment because it's what I had. It's what was there. And what was in front of me was so beautiful, I couldn't leave it alone. Uh, earlier I had photographed in the Eastern Sierra, it had been primarily for the Aspen color in fall, that beautiful gold. I have stacks of pictures of that, but this wasn't that time, this is January, February, March. So I, I was there in the middle of it, uh, and it was before me and it was beautiful, and I responded to it. I didn't come out there thinking I'm going to paint the red birch in spring, because I actually I hadn't been out there in spring when the red birch was turning so beautifully red. Um, so it was a discovery and an invention that happened. It was just a wonderful circumstances. In early spring, um, the trees looked dead. And the dried twigs and sucker shoots and branching is, uh, is grays and whites and blues and is all around. And then the new growth comes in kind of on top of that. It doesn't fall off or drop away. It's on top of it. So you have several layers of like whites and grays and then the reds and yellows and oranges and pinks kind of on top of that. Um, and then through that, behind that, you can see the landscape, the, the um, bushes and, and their grays and buff colors and browns, you know, from winter. And so I've 
the watercolor could be the background and the thicket, thickets are, are winter colors, browns and ochres. So I could put that in with a watercolor and then there's deep shadows where the trees come into the water and they're very, very dark and I'd lay that in an underpainting, a dark color, watercolor and let that dry. And then this thicket stuff would be very difficult to paint if you tried to paint branches. Um, but the, the pencils would go over the dark. If I put light pencil on the dark, it would pop out just the way that it does when you, when you look at it. And the lights on the light branches and they really come forward and then they sort of melt into the dark. And then the red colors would be bright against the um, buff colors of the winter landscape. So I would keep going back and forth with the dark on the light and the light on the dark and building where, where the branches are very, very thick and, and very, there are thin spikes coming out, the, the light bounces around in those uh, thickets. And so you get a, a kind of a halo, almost a red halo around them, red and orange halo. And then the waters underneath that reflect some of that light. So they're wonderful to draw because you get the, the colors reflected in the waters which look blue from the sky because the, the sky is intensely blue in wintertime in the Eastern Sierra. When, and so all of those colors could come together that way. And I found that the, the pencil was ideal for articulating the, the growth, that kind of spiny growth by the, it's, it's really thickets mm -hmm. over the, it makes a tunnel over the waters really. And the horses are at the pack, in the pack trains, um, in the pack stations come down to the bottom of the valley in the winter to winter in the winter forage and the meadows. So these empty meadows are suddenly full of all these horses and mules. So I was taking pictures of them and um, they're very funny and most of them are, are they're pretty sweet, you know, and some of them are old and broken down. But uh, I was at the, I was at, at a barbed wire fence and all, they would come over and want to talk to me and see if I had anything to give them and then they'd be too close to photograph. But I was just standing and this one red horse came over and he kept sticking his head between first over the wire and then he thought well maybe she's too short you know so he put his head between the wires you know um, to try and I think he thought maybe I wanted to give him you know a carrot or something when the mid-level didn't work he kept going lower and lower between different layers of barbed wire until he was like on the practically his head was practically laying on the ground you know and his lips were moving and he was really yeah trying to, trying to get that treat for me and I thought he's used to children you know, and they can't reach him. And so he goes lower for them so the little kids can give him some grass or something. Uh, so I got a picture of him sticking his uh, head between the wires and then later on, I couldn't resist, I just, this big red head was just too beautiful. And it had his hair, you know, their hair grows long under their jaws in the winter. It's this very coarse, long red hair. And so I, that was almost like the thickets. So I thought, well, I'll just draw the hair on the bottom of his jaw coming out. So I did.